consumed by Brexit agony. And still, it is impossible to say how and when the pain will stop. MPs are currently trying to find a Brexit consensus in defiance of the wishes of Prime Minister May. Her own deal remains short of a parliamentary majority, though she clings to the hope it will eventually prevail before time runs out. My guest is former Conservative Minister and longest serving MP Ken Clark. How close to breaking point is Britain's political system? Maastricht was a Tea Party compared with this. The Callaghan minority government was more straightforward. This is a shambles. It is a complete shambles. And the, the House has gone mad. It would be very entertaining if it wasn't all so serious at the moment. It is just a completely shambolic crisis. That's hard talk after the news. Hello, I'm Julie Candler with the BBC News. Members of Parliament in Britain are beginning a debate on alternative courses of action on Brexit as they attempt to break the deadlock that's gripped the political system. They're trying to gauge what options might command a majority. MPs have twice rejected the withdrawal deal negotiated with the EU by the Prime Minister Theresa May, but she may try again, as Norman Smith reports. The Prime Minister appeared to give a clear signal in the Commons this lunchtime that tomorrow or on Friday she will bring back a deal to be voted on for a third time. She said she hoped this week that others would support the deal. A decision made more likely by evidence some leading Brexiteers are indeed preparing to back Mrs May's agreement. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister faces a crucial meeting with Tory backbenchers this afternoon with senior figures suggesting they want her to set out a timetable for her departure. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, urged Mrs May to listen to Parliament or to stand down. Pakistan says it's fully opened its airports for all flights after keeping them closed for nearly a month because of tensions with neighbouring India. Pakistan International Airlines has resumed its flights to all domestic airports. Foreign airlines will also be able to land but are still prohibited from overflying Pakistan on their way to other destinations. A committee set up by the Japanese carmaker Nissan says there is sufficient evidence to suspect a violation of laws and company rules by its former head, Carlos Ghosn. A new report refers to a personality cult surrounding Mr. Ghosn, who was arrested and detained last year and subsequently released on bail. He denies the allegations. Here's our economics correspondent, Andrew Walker. Carlos Ghosn and the French carmaker Renault were widely seen as having rescued Nissan when the two firms created an alliance 20 years ago. An independent investigation said that as a result of this history, he was deified as a saviour who had redeemed Nissan from collapse. His activities were deemed impenetrable territory. Mr Ghosn has been charged with misstating his salary and with the misuse of company funds for personal purposes. The report calls for a number of reforms of the company's management, including that the board be made up of a majority of outside independent directors. Health officials in Mozambique say five cases of cholera have been confirmed following the cyclone that killed hundreds of people. There are fears the outbreak will spread. From Vera, non Serma Sekel reports. Devastating cyclone Idai roared through Mozambique's port city of Beira and the surrounding countryside nearly two weeks ago. Now, in its wake, comes the threat of a second disaster as the areas affected are bracing themselves for a public health crisis. The impact ranges from cholera, malaria and psychological trauma. World News from the BBC. The Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta has defended his government's response to drought in the north of the country. Last week, his deputy, William Ruto, described reports that people were starving or had died from hunger as fake news. Local officials contradicted that claim. Mr Kenyatta said the government had improved its response to drought. Austria's Chancellor Sebastian Kurz has said there's a financial link between the chief suspect in the New Zealand mosque attack, Brenton Tarrant, and an Austrian far-right group. Prosecutors said the leader of the Identarian movement was gifted about $1,700. Stephanie Bell reports from Vienna. Chancellor Kurz said there would be no tolerance for dangerous ideologies in Austria, whether it was radical Islam or right-wing fanaticism. He said the authorities were investigating further links between the Christchurch suspect and the Identitarians and could move to disband the group. In a video posted online, Martin Selner from the Identitarians said he'd received a donation from a person named Tarrant, but he said he'd had nothing to do with the attacks. 
Brenton Tarrant is believed to have visited Austria, possibly last November. The Japanese government has asked the heads of the country's four biggest convenience store chains to come up with plans to tackle critical shortages of labour. Franchise owners of Japan's omnipresent convenience stores are struggling to meet requirements to stay open around the clock because they can't find workers to keep stores open overnight. Japan's rapidly aging population has led to employment reaching its highest level in 45 years, with about 160 jobs available for every 100 workers. Cambodia has returned more than 60 parcels of land to indigenous peoples. The land was seized three decades ago. More than 700,000 people in Cambodia were affected, and the issue has become the subject of concern for campaigners and foreign investors. BBC News. Welcome to Hard Talk on the BBC World Service. I'm Stephen Sacker. Britain's Brexit psychodrama is entering its most intense phase. The EU has made its final offer on the departure deal and the deadlines. The UK really cannot put off making decisions any longer. Either the deal Theresa May negotiated with the EU27 gets parliamentary approval, or the UK leaves with no deal or it accepts a prolonged delay to Brexit, which could quite conceivably mean it never happens at all. As the country agonizes over its choices, there are splits and divisions everywhere between the government and parliamentarians, within both main political parties, and between the political class and a mightily frustrated public. Something has to happen very soon, but it's not clear what it will be. My guest is former Conservative Minister and the longest-serving MP, Ken Clark. He's seen a lot of political drama in his career, but has British politics ever been in a more parlous state? Well, he joins me now. Ken Clark, welcome to Hard Talk. Glad to be here. You have the rather wonderful title uh, of Father of the House because you're the longest-serving MP. You've seen a lot in your time, but have you ever seen Westminster as febrile, as hysterical, and as utterly unproductive as it is today? No. I'll give you my shortest answer to the program. <laughs> no, I did last week was a Tea Party compared with this. Uh, the Callaghan minority government was more straightforward. This is a shambles. It is a complete shambles, and the, the, the House has gone mad. We're beginning to make, I think, the last few days have seen progress back towards grown up sensible politics, I think. But it would be very entertaining if it wasn't all so serious at the moment. It is just a completely shambolic crisis. You use the word shambles, and of course, I think people watching from the outside are utterly confused about precisely what is going on right now. But you just put your name to uh, an effort by MPs to, quote unquote, take control away from the government and organize a Brexit strategy for themselves outside of government. Doesn't that simply add to the sense of shambles? No, it's a, you're giving a particular description of it, actually. What we've, well, I put my name to, what I voted for, and I've been pressing for for a long time, was putting on the agenda for a day what are, are called indicative votes, an opportunity for the House of Commons to debate properly and express a preference for a way forward towards what really matters, which is the ultimate destination. Uh, what are we actually aiming to see as our long-term arrangement with the rest of Europe. And uh, we finally managed to get a day where we can see where a consensus lies, where a consensus might emerge, where a majority is available. Let me stop you right there. It's like a Rubik's Cube. There are so many different options involving possibly a customs union, possibly a Norway-style model, possibly a revocation of Article 50 and a cancelling of Brexit altogether. So many different options that you suggest to me it can all be sorted by MPs in one day, that they can find what a, two, what a two common days. ground in one day. Well, that's what the aim is to actually uh, try to put in a process of solving the, the Rubik's Cube uh, and actually producing, eventually, identifying the one, perhaps two, possible approaches where a British government could negotiate with a serious chance of getting parliamentary approval. Should have been two, two years ago. If we'd done this two years ago, and it had been obvious what the government had authority to negotiate, what it didn't have authority to negotiate, the whole process would have proceeded on an altogether different basis, and we wouldn't have done so much damage 
the reputation of our politics and our parliamentary system as we have. But after two years of, of frankly, of fantasy politics with people mm -hmm. wishing for things they simply can't have, isn't this going to see MPs again just wishing for things they can't have? Because it's almost certain, is it not, that whatever you choose to coalesce around, Mrs. May will not accept. Well, she can't do that. Uh, she hasn't actually said that in quite the terms that's been reported either. Uh, she's reserved the right to reject what's undeliverable. Well, this is Mrs May. I cannot commit the government to delivering the outcome of any votes held by this House. And the words that are left out are her explanation of that, uh, that, of course, if the House were resolved for something undeliverable, she couldn't deliver it. That's been repeated by some of her colleagues with wild excitement surrounding it. The, the, the rule in the Britain, you'll be relieved to know, is that Parliament, the governments can only pursue policies if they have the approval of Parliament for those policies. Now, if the, it's quite right. If Parliament votes for something silly, uh, then there's nothing she can do. Parliament, I think, will vote for something more attractive to our European Union partners. Uh, I think if we vote for broadly a soft Brexit, then the EU leaders will quite easily agree to a long extension of Article 50 in order to negotiate that conclusion with the withdrawal agreement being left on the table for the time being until it's needed later on to conclude the whole thing. But you are a, a Democrat and you know that you know by 52 percent to 48 people voted to leave the European Union and you yes. also know that the two main parties in the last election ran on manifestos which guaranteed to deliver a Brexit and you according to all of those who support the notion of a harder Brexit are simply trying to undermine any meaningful departure from the European Union. I don't all say that, because that's nonsense. I have compromised more than most people have. It was 52-48, uh, the, the result. The trouble with the vote to leave was it didn't address any of the questions. Now before Paul, nobody expected leave to win. Nobody explained what leave meant. Most of the people who voted leave, like quite a lot of the campaigners, had quite different ideas. But that's why I advisedly then mentioned the election which we've had since then. And oh, Theresa yes. May made it quite plain that her red lines included no membership of the customs union, no membership of the single market, an end to freedom of movement, all of these things which you, with your soft Brexit, would like to see. Well, you repeat what is currently the mantra about the manifesto, which is daft. Neither party... You don't believe in the importance of manifestos, no, that sort of commitment to the people, remotely. this is what you'll get if they you vote for me? The people never see the manifesto. It's a press release put out late in the campaign. Uh, they, 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 I've never seen the manifesto. It was, it was a document which emerged when we were halfway through the campaign. Uh, it, it had never been discussed in Cabinet. No one sent me a copy. There was a very good policy in it about social care, which was disowned 48 hours later. That was the only feature of the manifesto. The Labour manifesto came out right towards the end, when all the candidates had been adopted and we were already campaigning. It's interesting to hear your view on how democracy works, so let's just play this it through. It works on the, on the members of Parliament exercising their, explaining their principles, explaining the policies, giving their judgment to the national interest, and then, quite rightly, they're judged by their constituents on what they deliver. So let That's us, how Parliament Right, so let us, let us just war game this and, and walk through how you think it might work. So here you sit, you MPs, over the next 24 hours, you are hoping to coalesce around something which can command a clear majority in the House of Commons. Yep. You think it will be something like, uh, some call it Common Market 2.0, it'll involve membership or of the Norway option. Yeah, it I, I personally, personally, my own first, first preference would be, which is a big compromise to me. I, I am accepting the verdict of the electorate. I've never previously in my life voted, never thought I'd vote for withdrawal. I'd say, yes, we are leaving the EU, mm. and I wish us to stay in the single market on the customs. Right. Market. Okay. So Something like that, yeah. I think, will emerge. All right. So let, let's park that and assume that over the next 24 hours, something like that might emerge from, from the various deliberations and votes of, of members yeah. of the House of Commons. Uh, uh, that's but, not settled. That's, that's, that's therefore the basis on which the British are then going to try to negotiate that conclusion with the European Union. Well, on, only uh, if, if they will the be very receptive. Only, though, if the executive arm of government, that is the government led by Theresa May, agrees to take that forward as policy. Now, Theresa May clearly will not do that. Well, are you? Is, is, that's, I, I agree with your first premise, that the executive's got to agree to carry it forward, and they, they're not in a position to refuse. They can't. They must just step down if to they're quote, not prepared. 
to quote, to quote with the well, approval of Parliament. To uh, quote the Solicitor General the other day, he said, we are now facing a major constitutional crisis, and this is the nub of the constitutional crisis, because you and your yeah, supporters in the House... about this marvellous argument they had, that it was quite wrong for the House of Commons to take control of its own, uh, uh, own, own, its own timetable. I know Robert Buckland, he gave it very convincingly, very well. Strictly speaking, legally, he's right. They may be rude, be rude about the Solicitor General, but that was a good try on... What we haven't talked about, because we've talked about outcomes, what we haven't talked about is one key change that might come to the, the process, and that is if, in this effort to coalesce around a common objective, MPs decide that actually the best thing to do is to put this back to the people and have a second referendum. I personally don't see what the second referendum would solve. Uh, I made it quite clear I was not going to be bound by the first referendum, these broad brush opinion polls on hugely complex subjects with a 52-48% result. I mean, I don't change my lifelong opinions on that basis, and I won't be bound by the second referendum, but I may find myself in the minority. I'm in the minority on the, my opinion of the first referendum. Just to follow this through, we don't know what MPs are going to decide. We then don't know how the government is going to respond to it. It seems to me, your word at the beginning, sham may well continue for many more days of complete uncertainty and yet there is one thing that is quite certain the European Union won't negotiate anymore they say the deal is on the table take it or leave it and they say if you don't come up with a approval of Theresa May's deal then on April 12th you will leave the European Union unless you give us a very good reason why you shouldn't no, no, let's get this clear that the EU is wa are waiting to negotiate with us. They're hoping to negotiate with us. They quite rightly won't renegotiate the terms of withdrawal deal, which is this little preparatory agreement on citizens' rights, the money, and Ireland, which I support. I vote for it. Mm. Quite harmless. The, the, the right wing of my party invented all these crank theories that it was a wicked continental plot to trap trappers in their fiendish ways, uh, which is a lot of nonsense. Is it uh, that the Irish backstops a temporary thing which should probably never be brought in and is obviously temporary if it is, and there's nothing wrong with the Irish backstop anyway. Uh, so what they want us to do is move to the serious negotiations on the long-term arrangements, uh, and and I think the House of Commons may well do that. I just wonder whether you're reading Europe the right way. Let me quote to you Emmanuel Macron. In the case of a negative vote, and he meant a, a new negative vote on Theresa May's deal, uh, we will be going to no deal, he said. We all know that. It is absolutely essential to be clear because it is a matter of the good functioning of the EU. We cannot have what I would call an excessive new extension. Perfectly reasonable position for him to take up before one of the councils. What the last council agreed was, if Theresa's deal is rejected again, I don't think Theresa's deal is likely to be brought back before the House of Commons, but if it's rejected again, then we go back to before May with uh, an arrangement which we, we suggest what we then do, she can go back and seek an extension uh, and, and say, let us start on the outline of where we're going and, of course, eventually you'll have to expect the withdrawal agreement, but when you see where you're going, I can't see how anybody maintains the slightest objection to the withdrawal agreement, which is quite harmless. You say you, as a Conservative MP, do not think that Theresa May will bring her deal back to be voted on for a third time because you think she can't get the vote. Unquestionately, she does. I can't you, 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 vote for it. It's you, quite harmless. Yeah. Do you think she should resign, I suppose, is the real question? No, I don't think she should resign. Uh, it's not because she's actually handling things magnificently, and she is at the moment under a very great deal of pressure. People are very critical of her on all sides. But you don't resolve chaos by adding to the chaos. If she resigns at this stage and causes a Tory leadership election, we'll have at least six weeks of bloodletting in the Conservative Party, and everybody, suddenly everybody's distracted whilst we fight this out. Presumably the Europeans are waiting, meanwhile, for us to get this particular latest fit over. No, but what if she resigns? No one see a winner emerging, likely to reunite the party or be able to tackle the problem. Yeah, blood, the there's no time for bloodletting right now, but what if she says, I'll leave, for example, on June 30th once this deal, my deal, has been voted through as a means to get the votes to just get the deal over the line. Well, that could happen. 
it seems to me the darkest possible reason for all these people who previously were standing on the highest possible principles of the constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom and beating off wicked continental threats. But apparently they'll accept all that if, if, as long as they've got rid of Theresa as Prime Minister, which they tried in a coup about three months ago and couldn't get enough votes to achieve. Anyway, if they, if they want to behave like that, at least it'll get us through uh, without a, 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 a no-deal exit. Uh, and it'll get us through, eventually, to negotiations starting. Then the Conservative Party has got to find somebody capable of keeping the party together and negotiating a deal which can carry a majority in Parliament. At least, when we have the leadership election, the House of Commons might, now, in the next few days, make it clear to that future leader what the parameters of that negotiation have got to be. Given the complete fragmentation and division inside the Tory party today, who is that person who could unite it, just keep it together even? I have the first idea, which is why Theresa May should not make this foolish offer to get her deal through. I think uh, much she might want to give it up. I feel very sorry for Theresa, who wasn't the cause of any of this in the first instance. She's not always handled it well. I think she is doomed to continue to be a uh, leader, and I think the Conservative Party is doomed to accept that she should continue to lead. Let me put so the question... I think we won't get... I won't join in if you start naming people and getting me to comment on individuals. That always causes a sensation. No, I'm don't. not asking but you... But my answer to your question mm. is I can't think of a solitary one of them who would be... I'm not sure any of them would hold the party together at all, particularly after a leadership election. But I can't see one who'd be better placed than Theresa to deliver the negotiations that follow. While you don't seem prepared to indulge in names, can you think of some possible leaders, certainly people who would like to be leaders of your party, who if they became leaders post Theresa May, you would no longer be able to be a member of that party? Yes, of course I can. I, I, I don't. I, I, Boris I, Johnson. I, I'm a, I'm a, you're trying to put names to me. And I Dominic Raab. No, I, 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 am not, I probably wouldn't leave the party because I'm a mainstream conservative. I mean, in my entire political adult lifetime, I've been in the party. But uh, I'm, I'm a mainstream conservative and some of, the, you know, some of these people are not. And <laughs> but I'd probably stay nominally sitting on the benches. They can send me the whip if they want to let me know what's coming on and ask me to support them, but I think some of the would-be leadership candidates would not, in any practical terms, be leading me. Thank you very much. Are you ashamed of your party and the way it's behaved in recent times? No, 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 no you're ashamed. I'm baffled. I mean, I did, it is... Both parties are in a similar mess. Both well, parties, we, we don't both worry. Parties, we talk to both Labour parties, senior both parties, figures. Both parties are in danger of going extinct if they mishandle this. I mean, the older parties have died off in France and plenty of other Western democracies where they have similar problems. Do you think the Conservative the Party faces the threat of its extinction today? Well, not surviving in its present form. The threat of a permanent split is honestly quite clear. I think the Conservative Party will go through it. If you don't mention the word Europe then the Conservative Party is reasonably cohesive on everything else as a centre-right party. But you were getting me at the moment to go into this leadership election. These are dangerous months to come. And under the wrong leader, because some fanatic faction or others managed to get one of their candidates to take over, then the risk of breaking up gets even worse. You asked me the question, what would happen if some person who I regarded as not really my kind of conservative mm. took over? Well, personally, I'd park myself in the party, unless, unless, of course, they turned around and purged it and got rid of me anyway, which would simplify things. But I would not regard myself as bound by the whip of being led by some of the people who think they're going to come leader if they can succeed in getting rid of it. Now, that's why I don't think they will. They, don't forget, the first thing the ERG did was try a coup against her. They ran it rather incompetently, and they failed. And the rules that, mean they can't try again for 12 months. Indeed. Fascinating, your view of what's happening inside the Tory party. There's perhaps a bigger picture, which is even more important. That is, what is happening to our political culture generally? Is there a disconnect wider, more dangerous than you've ever seen before between the political class, if I can put it that way, and the public, the voters, the people who elect these people but feel at the moment so utterly let down by them. Yes. 
And also, I'd widen it even further, it's happening in every Western democracy. Something fundamentally very dangerous is happening. Trump, Brexit, yellow jackets, a kind of anarchist government in Italy, I could go on. Uh, they're all the same thing. There's a disconnect between what was a fairly settled political order, our traditional post-war democratic liberal uh, constitutions, and sections of the general public. I think it's the pace of change. It's the fact that the modern economy benefits the young, the well-educated, the enterprising, the forceful, who happen to live in the right cities. There's a great bulk of the population who feel left behind. A lot of these things, from Trump to the Five Star Movement to Brexit, that section of the population who dislike the elite, feel left behind. Their living standards are stagnant. The old blue-collar jobs have gone. Or if they're the Shah Tories, the world's changing too quickly. People talk foreign languages on the bus. And my generation of politicians, I'm, I'm a veteran survivor of the well, citizen establishment, I, we never found a way of tackling that. No, they're angry you, and enraged now. It's so interesting what you say, because I can't think of a more consummate insider than Ken Clark, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, served four different Tory Prime Ministers, yeah. wanted to be leader of your party for so very long. You've been in Parliament for decades and decades. Be brutal about it. You are part of the problem. You have to take your share of the blame. Well, I, I of course, will try to take credit as well. Yeah, I, but I, that is mea culpa. I think I was blind to the danger growing, as I think were most of my contemporaries, I assumed that 1990s, the great normality, uh, the emerging economies were entering the system. We had a rules-based global order. In Britain, we had growth with low inflation. Uh, great, the, you know, the economy was marching yeah, on. You thought capitalism worked for everybody, and we it's not true. We finally got free markets to the social conscience to work. Uh, well, you I, thought I, so, but I, clearly I, not. I fa- we, uh, we, we neglected, we failed. And nobody knows how to do it now. How to include the, 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 those people who are not going to be able to take leading roles, whose living standards have stagnated or sometimes fallen in subsequent time, those towns, those communities, those regions, such bold industrial well, areas. Well, let, let me stop you there. And, 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 That's and where the protest is coming from. The Trump vote yes. is very we are very similar to the protest votes we get here. Well, let's end then by bringing it back to Brexit. Uh, George Freeman, another Tory colleague of yep. yours, said this recently. He said, I've never known this country so divided, so angry, in such a dangerous state. I think we are close to civil unrest. And we have had death threats to MPs, death threats to people who run petitions trying to get revocation of Article 50. There is a toxic atmosphere in this country. How worried, how dangerous do you feel this country well, well, I, I, I agree. We, there is a toxic atmosphere of anger, and you know, the political system is getting itself held in contempt. I don't think you should over dramatise it. I don't think violence is imminent, but the yellow jackets you know, took me by surprise in, in France. But to be, let's, let's stop getting too excited and go back to a reassuring note, because I think we've made progress. That's why we need to get people to care less around a soft Brexit. All right, we're leaving the political union. Great pity weaken as a political power. We're staying in the common market. We're not breaking our trading laws. Start bringing the 52% back together with the 48%. Allow the parties to sort of shuffle back rather guiltily to being parties. Reassure the public that we are grown-up people who will govern in the best interest and reach compromise. Stop polarizing and moving to extremes as we've been doing. Uh, that will satisfy the things which George Freeman, I quite agree with him, is quite rightly worried about. This is a nasty political atmosphere at the moment. Ken Clark, thanks for being on Hard Talk. Excellent. This is the BBC World Service, bringing you compelling documentaries from around the world. Mexico, a country infamous for its drug cartels, has another booming black market. They will bring big jugs, and then they will put a hose on it, and they will blow into it, put it directly into your car. Criminals are tapping into pipelines and peddling petrol. People see this as a robbing.